are being used by the German military in the Second World War. Um, That's General Guderian's communications truck, and in the bottom you can see the machine. Uh, we can zoom in on it a bit. Here's the machine down here. It looks like a typewriter. And you have three operators. You have um, one person here who has the message, and he reads out the message. The other person types it into the machine. The person at the bottom types it into the machine. When you type in the message, hello, then lights light up. So H-E-L-L-O might light up P-V-Z-Q-A. This middle, uh, middle person writes down P-V-Q-Z-A. And then the person at the top, the radio operator, sends the message in, in, uh, over the radio. And then the other end, you reverse the process. A radio operator writes down PVQZA, somebody reads out PVQZA, somebody types it in, and you get hello. So that's how the machine worked in the field. And um, here's another picture and close up again. Here's the keyboard down here, and here's the lamp board. Here's where the lamps lit up. Um, so you can see how the machine worked. Now, I'm fortunate enough that, that I, I have a machine, we have it here on the desk. Now, I Thing. If we can go back to the lighting we had this morning um, when we were rehearsing, which I think is pretty much maybe all the lights up in the room, because I think what that does is it gives us good light on the machine so that we can um, project that up onto the screen. Is that okay? How are we doing on the camera? Yeah. Great. So this is this is the machine here. It sits in a wooden box. Um, and as you saw from the picture before, it's got a keyboard here, and it's got a lamp board here. And um, I type in letters, and lamps light up. So if I type in the letter P, it's a little bit unreliable, but we'll give it a go. If I type P, a Y lights up, OK? And what's really clever about the Enigma is if, if I keep typing P and I keep getting Y, then this old frequency analysis problem crops up. If I type P again, I get a Z. Oh, W, an R. Oops. Yeah, v. So you can see it's, it's, it's got a random output, a pseudo-random output. And that's the important thing about the Enigma. So why are we getting a pseudo-random output? Well, if we go inside, we've got three rotors here. And the 26 wires go from the keyboard along the side and into these rotors. If I take the rotors out, Um, there we go. You can see there's 26 contacts here, and um, there are 26 contacts on the other side. And in between, it's like spaghetti. The wiring is completely mixed up. Now, if you type an A, an A will always go in at the top, but it might come out as an E. It goes in here as an E, it might come out as a, a Q, and so on. So it's the scrambled wiring inside the rotor that leads to the encryption. Now, on its own, that's not secure because every time I type A, it follows the same electrical path and you get the same output. But what's clever about the Enigma is every time I type a letter, say A, this moves one place. A still goes in at the top, but that's a different contact. Moves again, I type A again, it goes in at the top, but it's a different contact. And when this does a full revolution, it kicks the middle one at uh, one place. So it's the dynamism of the rotors that leads to the continually changing encryption. Um, and if I put this back and I'll leave the lid open, if I type P again, there we go, you can just see this rotor moving. If we're lucky, we might see the middle one move. No, it, it, well, as you can see how the encryption works in that, in that way. And um, if you've got one of these machines, and I've got one of these machines, we can obviously communicate very easily. Uh, but there's one thing you need to know as well. You need to have the machine, but you also need to know how the machine is set up. That's the key uh, that's used for the encryption. And when it comes to the Enigma, there are many things that you can change. Um, I can change the, the, or the, the, the position of these rotors. Um, typically, you would have maybe eight rotors, and you would pick three from eight uh, in any orientation, any permutation. Um, the orientation of these rotors I can change. Um, where one wheel kicks the next wheel, I can change. 
Um, also, just down here, you can't really see it very well. Just at the very bottom, um, there are plugs. And what these plugs do is they swap letters around. So I can plug A with M. If I plug A with M, every time I type A, it follows the path of M. Every time I type M, it follows the path of A. And I have 20 plugs to put in 26 holes. And this has 100 million permutations. Okay? So, so uh, with, with, if we just say three rotors, three rotors and three positions is six permutations. Um, these three rotors have 26 orientations. That's 26 cubed, which I think is 17,000. 17,000 times the six permutations is 100,000. Um, I can change this kickover point, so 26 times 100,000 is 2.5 million. I can change this kickover point, that's another 26, is 50 million, times 100 million. Uh, you can see there's a vast, vast key space. And that's what you need to, that's why this machine is considered so secure. It's dynamic, it moves, it's got a vast number of keys. Even if you steal the machine, uh, even if the Allies and the British stole the machine, they would still have to work out the setup of the machine. That's where the security lies, in knowing the setup of the machine. But if you know the setup, then it's easy. So let's try and actually um, send, a de send a message and decode a message. So if I type the letter message o, OK, O gives me a A, and K gives me a X. So OK is AX. I send that. Somebody wants to decode AX. The machine has to be in the same setup, so I'm going to move that back and move that back. Now if I type in AX, I should get OK. A gives me a O, and X gives me K. So encryption and decryption is simple if you have the machine and if you have the correct setting. Um, I'm going to go back to the laptop in a moment, but if people have any questions uh, about the machine, um, and I'll talk a bit about how it was decoded in a minute, but if people have questions about the machine and how it was used uh, and its impact, I'm happy to try and take questions now uh, while I've got the machine open. Anybody has a question yet? Fine. So the, the setup of the machine, every month uh, there would be a central bureau, a central office that would print a sheet of paper. And the sheet of paper would, for every day, so today is the 29th, it would say use these three rotors in this permutation, in this orientation, and with these plug settings. And that piece of paper would be distributed to everybody in our network. So we might be North Africa. So the North African enigmas could talk to each other. The U-boats in the Atlantic would have a different piece of paper so that they could talk to each other. But that piece of paper has to be taken by motorbikes over the Sahara. Or the U-boats have to come back and collect them. So this distribution of paper is it's expensive, it's slow, and it's risky. And, and if, you, if you were a U-boat, a German U-boat uh, uh, operator of an Enigma, and, and the U-boat was captured, you didn't really care if the machine was taken. Because it's clear that the British will get hold of the machine sooner or later, because there are, there are hundreds of these machines, maybe even thousands. But the paper was the precious thing. So the paper would be printed with water-soluble ink. And on U-boats, you would have a bucket of water next to the machine. And if you were boarded, you would put the paper in the water to get rid of the settings. And, um, <clears throat> and if, 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 if the Allies uh, and the Americans also captured these bits of paper as well, if they captured a bit of paper, then you want to catch it early in the month. Okay? If you catch it on the 1st or 2nd of, of October, that's great, because then you have a whole month of, of settings. If you capture it on the 29th, it's not really so much good. Although I suppose you can go back through time and decode other messages. I should say also one important thing is that if I'm sending messages to you and we've got this bit of paper, the first thing I do is I send you three letters. Okay, that's the first thing I do. 
And those letters might be A, B, C. If I send you A, B, C, what I'm telling you to do is to move your rotors to positions one, two, three. And so for our, everybody in our network has the same setting. But for our message, we agree a new setting, okay? And then if I send some, a message to somebody over here, I might say uh, 24, 25, 26, X, Y, Z. So that's my new setting. So yeah, anybody else? I'll just show you a couple of bits of machine then before I close it. Um, the, the interesting things you might want to look at are, um, it works just with a battery. I've got a couple of modern batteries in here, but it, it worked with, with kind of just an old chunky battery, I guess, in, in, in the 1930s. Um, it's got a, a bright setting, a dark setting, um, off, and if your battery is flat, you have an external power supply just here. Um, if you're working at night, one of the things you're, you might be fearful of is that the light from here could attract a sniper. So the Germans uh, would sometimes employ one of this is just a piece of thick green plastic. So if I put this over the top, um, there, just, just fades through so you don't give off any flashes of light. Um, it, it, one of the things is that um, the, 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 the Navy version, there are different versions. This is a standard Army version. But the Navy version uh, became more complicated. Um, there's a chunk here at the end which can be reduced in size. And the German Navy added a fourth rotor. So the German Navy version was 26 times more complicated to break. Um, if something goes wrong, it's a complicated machine to try and fix because everything's moving, everything's dynamic. Uh, but they've built in some nice features. So if I press a key and I don't release it, then nothing moves. So now I can begin to spot where the problem is. I can do a, what's called a walkthrough test. And if I hit a key where something is, let's say I hit a key and a bulb doesn't light up, if I want to test the bulb, I think, well, maybe this bulb's not working. There's a bulb tester here. Um, and these bulbs are 78 years old. Um, they're all original bulbs. They, they, they're flatter than a normal bulb, because if you put a normal bulb, I used, we used to have these bicycle bulbs when I was a, a child. If you put one of those in there, it gets crushed. Um, by the top, so they're, they're all, as I say, decades old, these bulbs. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about how the code was broken. Any last questions before I move on? Somebody way, way at the back. Ah, there's a microphone coming to you, great. Why does the machine doesn't have any numbers? Ah, right, so the machine, you're right, doesn't have any numbers at all, it doesn't have any punctuation, it doesn't have a space bar. Um, I think the reason is, if this is quite heavy, and if you double the number of them, so you have, you'd have 10 numerals, and maybe five or six bits of punctuation, you would go from 26 keys to maybe 35 or 40 keys. And that, that would increase the weight by 50%. It would increase the likelihood of something going wrong by 50%. So if I wanted to send you a number, I would just, uh, maybe I would type, um, I'm making this up a little bit, but I would type N-U-M, and then I would type B-D-E would be two, four, five. Okay, so I would use the letters as numbers. And as a space bar, if I want a space, I just type X. So between every word, there would be an X to, to show the space. So I, I think it's purely a case of increasing reliability and reducing weight. Um, there was somebody over there had a question as well, I think. Yeah, I wanted to ask how you got this machine and what is the story of this? Ah, so this machine, um, there's, there's a very, if you're really interested in the history of cryptography, there's a very good book called The Code Breakers by David Kahn. It's about 1,600 pages long. Um, it's a huge book. 
And, um, and I, I, I know David, and um, he knew I was writing this book, and I said to David, do you know where I might get a machine from? It would be, be great, having spent so much time studying this machine and writing about it, to have a machine. And he had a friend who recently passed away, um, who'd done translations for him. And he was an American, uh, an American cryptographer in the Second World War called Bradford Hardy. So he'd worked in France with the German military, and they'd captured a lot of these machines, and they were stored in a tent. And Bradford Hardy had seen these machines and just picked one up and took it back to America with him, um, and kept it in his home in Texas. Um, and then when he passed away, and, and David told me that he had this machine, um, I, I approached his family and I said, if you, you know, if you send it to me, what we'll do is we'll take it around school. So this machine goes around schools in England a lot to try and show students um, the application of mathematics and how maths can really change history. So to try and show, show that maths is more than just solving problems on paper, it's about solving real technological problems as well. Um, this machine is actually, you can just see, you can't quite see, maybe, no, you can't quite see. Here is the date on the lid, it's 1936. So I was saying these machines were being built way before the Second World War. And, um, and that means that this machine is, is quite well built. Later on in the war, they weren't quite so well built because they had to rush them out more quickly. But this is a 1936 machine. Maybe one last question if anybody has one. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's a really good point. Let me, let me come to that um, on my slides. And I'll, I'll repeat your question as well if people didn't hear it. If we can go back to my slides, thank you. Um, 